So I originally wrote this whole intro about Alabama blowing out Texas. And then the Longhorns played them down to the wire and ruined that. So yesterday uh, around, uh, what was it, like 2 o'clock, I, I wrote a new intro that at least assumed that A&M and Baylor would both win. And then, well, I think you know what happened. Um, I think there's a Bible verse about this somewhere. Many are the plans in a man's heart. Learned my lesson on uh, trying to you know, keep up with the previewing stuff too far out. Grief share meeting for A&M and Baylor fans in the cafe after service. And uh, we do need to heal up a little bit before the Cowboys have to play Tom Brady tonight. So thanks for that reminder, Craig. And if you're not a football fan, thanks for putting up with those of us that are. This is week three of our fall sermon series, Everyday Faithfulness, where we walk through the Apostle Paul's first letter to the church in Thessalonica and discover how we too are called to faithfulness in all seasons of life. We're stepping into chapter two today, so if you'd like to follow along, you can turn there with me now, 1 Thessalonians chapter two. A little bit of backstory as you do that. A common sight in the ancient world in a city like Thessalonica was a sophist. Uh, remember that we are uh, stepping into um, a letter that is in, uh, being written to a church in ancient Greece. Thessalonica is in ancient Greece. So the culture is not Jewish, like we're often used to thinking if we're in the Old Testament or in the Gospels. This is a decidedly Greek and Roman culture, complete with togas, olive leaves worn as headdress, pantheons of gods, and street corner philosophers. Sophists were such people. They specialized in any number of topics, ranging from uh, philosophy, religion, music, even mathematics. Can you imagine a society where people just gave math lectures from the street corner? Sometimes history just makes you thankful for your own country and your own time period, you know? <laughs> anyway, sophists would travel from town to town. They would stand on the street corner. They'd, they'd go to the town square. They'd monologue about their topic of choice. And it wouldn't matter whether anyone showed up or not. They would just go on and on to their heart's content, just an incessant flow of opinions and hot takes. And thankfully today we have social media for that kind of thing. Most of the time, however, they did draw a crowd. This was a world where there were not many forms of entertainment. And so listening to an eloquent speaker uh, talk passionately about his subject was one of the better options. Sophists would draw a crowd, they would play on people's hopes and fears, and then after getting everyone hooked, they'd ask for money, they'd chase after women, they would typically look to stay at the house of a wealthy citizen and eat their food and use their resources, and then they'd move on to the next town. Well, in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, Paul is defending himself against some critiques of some of the Thessalonian public uh, have apparently leveled against him. Remember that this letter is being written in response to the report that Timothy has brought back to Paul. And the report was the Thessalonians are doing great, but they've had some social pressure. And we infer from chapter two that some of that social pressure was that there were apparently uh, some folks in the Thessalonican community outside the church who had basically launched a smear campaign against Paul and Silas and Timothy, making them out to have been nothing more than sophists, men who come into town, charm and woo with eloquent speech, take advantage of people's hospitality, consume resources, and then abandon their followers. Sophists didn't produce any lasting results. Most people uh, saw them as charlatans because they didn't produce lasting results. And so uh, this is what is being said about Paul and his companions. Now you look at 1 Thessalonians 2 verse 1. You know, brothers and sisters, that our visit to you was not without results. We had previously suffered and been treated outrageously in Philippi, as you know, but with the help of our God, we dared to tell you his gospel in the face of strong opposition. So Paul is concerned about this, this smear campaign. Not only does it threaten his reputation, but remember that the believers in Thessalonica were new Christians. And if they're influenced by these people saying that Paul was nothing more than a sophist, they may not only change their perspective of Paul, but their perspective of the gospel of Jesus as well. This is a serious issue. Paul is speaking against this smear campaign here, defending himself. Our visit was not without results, he tells them. And one of the things we'll see again and again in this chapter, we see it a couple of times here, is, is Paul saying, you know. 
You know, brothers and sisters, that our visit to you is not without results. We had uh, been treated outrageously in Philippi, as you know. Uh, He's trying to reassure them of what they know to be true. We're not dealing in rumors here or secondhand information. You were there. You bore witness to these things. You know. You experienced real conversion, real presence of the Holy Spirit. And another piece of evidence that we're not charlatans. We suffered in Philippi. In our previous stop before we met you, we had been treated outrageously. So Paul's basically saying, look, we're the opposite of sophists. Sophists don't produce lasting results, but people love them. Everywhere they go, there's lots of money. There's tons of women. They find favor with the Greek elite. None of that is true for us. We've been beaten. We've been thrown in prison, run out of town. People literally spit on us and hurl insults at us. We're not in this for money, women, or fame. There are no ulterior motives here. And you can know that because despite the suffering we faced, we dared to press on to Thessalonica and tell you the gospel too. And notice that while Paul is defending himself and he is defending the character and the reputation of of, uh, Silas and Timothy, his companions, it's not just about that. It's about the gospel itself. We talked last week about influence, how influence is the currency of the culture how influence shapes what we believe and how we live. Paul and Silas and Timothy were the representatives of the gospel to the Thessalonians. So when their character and their motives came under question, it was a serious issue, not just for them, but for the gospel itself. If they were thought to be frauds, it would inevitably happen that the gospel would be cast into the same light as well. Just another hollow philosophy by a group of charlatans. And it strikes me how similar this is to what we often see in our own day and age. If you pay attention to uh, articles, interviews, podcasts, people who have left churches, who have uh, denounced denominations, or even deconverted from Christianity altogether, do you know what theme you will hear coming up again and again and again? They were hurt by the people. Sometimes it's that a a church leader was caught up in a scandal and and they lost confidence in that leader. Sometimes it's that they were uh, directly mistreated by a person or a group of people. Sometimes it it was just that the church culture got so unhealthy that it was untenable for them to remain. But in most cases, the reason people leave churches or even Christianity itself has nothing to do with Jesus and everything to do with people. And that may not sound right to you, If you're like me, you may be thinking no one should ever leave the faith because of a bad experience with another person or a group of people or even a single church. God is so much bigger than that. I agree with you. But if you think about it, if you didn't grow up in the church, you don't have that foundation of faith. You're a new Christian and the only other Christians you know wound you or fail you or mistreat you in some way. Your connection to this belief system is really founded on your experience with this one group of people. And then you realize those people aren't who they claim to be. It all unravels from there. It was this way 2000 years ago and it's still this way today. Now to be clear, this was not the case for the Thessalonians. Paul, Silas, and Timothy were exactly who they claimed to be. But Paul was concerned that the Thessalonians might be led to believe otherwise Because Paul knew that when people leave, in the vast majority of cases, it has nothing to do with Jesus and everything to do with people. And Paul also knew that his influence and Silas's influence and Timothy's influence was an essential part of these young Christians' spiritual foundation. In the same way, your example and my example carry more influence than we might know. There are no doubt people in your life maybe family, friends, coworkers, perhaps someone more on the fringe of your life that associates you with what it means to be a Christian, to go to church, maybe even with Jesus Christ himself. You may be the only reference point for someone who didn't grow up in church, who doesn't have that foundation of faith, who's searching and seeking. And your example matters. The way you carry yourself matters. How you treat people how quick you are to forgive, how likely you are to extend grace and encouragement, what you support, what you share on social media, 
These are the kinds of things that influence others. Our example not only speaks volumes about us, but about the Jesus we follow as well. As the old saying goes, you may be the only Bible someone ever reads. And the gospel is worth our lives. This is why Paul says, even though we suffered in Philippi, we dared to press on to Thessalonica and share the gospel with you too. We're not in this for any ulterior motive, he writes. For the appeal we make does not spring from error or impure motives, nor are we trying to trick you. On the contrary, we speak as those approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel. We're not trying to please people, but God who tests our hearts. You know we never use flattery, nor did we put on a mask to cover up greed. God is our witness. And these are the sorts of tactics that sophists would use. They would employ these sorts of things. This is what people might be leery of from from those preaching a new philosophy or a new belief system, that they would say whatever they had to say, they would do whatever they had to do to, to butter up the people. But it was all a mask for greed and selfishness. And Paul's saying, that's not who we are. You know this. You know that we never did any of those things. We're not trying to trick you with some vain philosophy. This isn't bait and switch. What, what we preach comes from God himself and he has entrusted it to us. He goes on, we were looking, we we're not looking for praise from people, not from you or anyone else, even though as apostles of Christ, we could have asserted our authority. So he's saying, uh, you know, we, we could have said, hey, we're divinely appointed agents of the God of the universe. So give us money and food and serve us as your spiritual leaders. But we never did any of those things. Instead, And this is the hinge of the passage. This is the turning point here. He's been talking about what they weren't. They weren't like the sophists, right? With their impure motives and their flattery and their greed. They weren't seeking praise from people. Instead, we were like young children among you. You might remember back in the spring, we went through a series called um, The Best of Us, where we looked at the reflections of the glory of God in different ages and seasons of life. And in week one of that series, we started by uh, considering the godly traits of children. And one of those traits that we highlighted that morning was transparency. Children are genuine. To my parents of teenagers in the room, if your teen walks in the room and randomly says, mom, dad, I love you, what's your first thought? What do you want, right? I mean, let's be honest. Teens, no offense. Adults do this too, but there's pretense, right? When a three-year-old or a four-year-old says, mom, I love you, or dad, I love you, your heart melts. Why? Because you know there's no hidden agenda here. There's no ulterior motive. I mean, that would be a super, super like crafty three-year-old, you know? I mean, I'm not saying it's never happened, but most of the time we know this is genuine. And, uh, and, and so Paul's saying that is what we were like among you. That's the the idea that this phrase carries. We were like young children, transparent and genuine. And then he flips the metaphor. He says, just as a nursing mother cares for her children, so we cared for you. So now Paul and his companions aren't children. They're they're like loving parents. Specifically, Paul says that they were like nursing mothers. And uh, to my guys in the room, hey, our sisters in Christ have to put up with a lot of sports illustrations and a lot of examples of of heroes uh, being a, male leaders as the heroes. So the imagery of a nursing mother might not be something that we would normally naturally apply to our uh, our leadership, Uh, but that's the image that Paul uses here, a nurturing, tender, loving image of his ministry. And uh, I love that he didn't hesitate to elevate this feminine view of a nursing mother and consider it worthy uh, to be uh, used as an illustration of his leadership. As we all know, male and female are created in the image of God. There are plenty of examples through scripture of both men and women providing leadership to God's people. And so Paul appeals to this image of a loving parent uh, to, uh, to describe his ministry. Like a nursing mother whose children are totally dependent on her for survival, so we were among you. We were there, we cared for you, we, we encouraged you, we prayed for you, we served you night and day. And notice the familial language here. Last week, we noted that Paul calls the church brothers and sisters more in 1 Thessalonians than in any other letter in the New Testament. And here he says, we were like young children among you. 
And then he also says, we were like a nursing mother among you, caring for you like she cares for her children. And it's not a coincidence that he continues returning to this familial language. He wants to communicate intimacy with the Thessalonian church because this is the culture of a healthy church. Last week, we talked about the marks of a healthy church and how one of those is the church as a family. We see that language in Paul calling the church brothers and sisters and talking about being innocent and genuine like young children, caring for them like a nursing mother cares for her children. We strive to be the same way at Pioneer Drive. One of our core values is that we are an ever-expanding family. And what we mean by that is that we will authentically model God's radical love in our multi-generational fellowship by inviting and including people from all walks of life to share their lives together in the gospel. This is not a slogan we say. It is a way of life that we embody. It's who we are and who we want to be. The church is a family. We look after one another. We pick one another up. We hold one another accountable. We encourage one another. We're vulnerable and open with one another. And we love each other so much. And this is the sign of deep love, that our lives are open to one another. Paul tells the Thessalonians, because we loved you so much, we were delighted to share with you not only the gospel of God, but our lives as well. Because we loved you so much, we were delighted to share our lives with you. There's no greater gift that you can give to someone than sharing your life with them in community. Our lives are the most precious thing that we have. Life cannot be replicated. It cannot be supplemented. You can't make any more of it for yourself. You get one life. And we realize this, we know this, that this realization drives us to do all sorts of things. There are videos all over the internet of of people doing ridiculous things and yelling YOLO, right? Ride a unicycle down the interstate, YOLO. Dress up like Elvis and play hopscotch, YOLO. Go skydiving and land inside a volcano, YOLO. I really can't criticize it because I do this too. Uh, When we travel anywhere in Texas, I I look to see if we're going to be near a Texas monthly top 50 barbecue restaurant. I really want to hit them all. I doubt I will, but we'll have fun trying, you know? And anyway, uh, every time we do this, Anna's like, are we really going to stand in line and take way too much time and spend way too much money at yet another barbecue restaurant? I'm like, babe, YOLO, none of us are promised tomorrow. Like, what if, what if you die? What if you got to the end of your life and you never experienced number nine on Texas Monthly's top 50 barbecue restaurants? And she's like, I think I'd be fine with that. <laughs> but the truth is none of us are promised tomorrow. We do only have one life to live. But instead of that inspiring us to do dumb stuff or irresponsible stuff or delicious stuff, it should inspire us toward godliness. It should motivate us to love one another all the more, to invest deeper in our community, to encourage those around us to greater faithfulness and to chase after Jesus with everything we have. You get one life. You choose what to do with it. You choose how to spend it. It's precious and it's fleeting. And so the greatest gift that you can give to someone is to share your life with them in community. Paul writes, because we loved you so much, we were delighted to share with you not only the gospel of God, but our lives as well. At Pioneer Drive, We believe in sharing our lives together. We believe in the church being a family. And this is lived out every day in our culture here and and through the relationships that we share. But if you're new around here, you're looking for a a group of people to share your life with, maybe you haven't quite found that, that deep sense of community yet, I'd like to invite you to commit to a discipleship group. We have tons of wonderful Sunday school classes here on Sunday mornings and a lot of great midweek small groups that meet both on campus and uh, in various places around town. There are men's groups, women's groups, couples groups, young adult groups, senior adult groups, and everything in between. So if you're looking for community, if you're willing to go deeper with some people who will love you and encourage you, if you're interested in learning more about what that looks like, you can come see our Next Steps team at the Big Blue Wall right after the service. They'd love to answer any questions you have, help you get plugged in. You can also email our discipleship pastor, Jeff Scott, at jscott at pioneerdrive.org. 
We all need community. We have a saying around here, you may have seen it on a blue t-shirt, everyone needs a friend. We all need brothers and sisters who will come alongside us and encourage us and pray for us and invest in us and share their lives with us. That's the beauty of the local church. None of us are in this alone. God in his grace has seen to it that we have one another. And this, more than anything else, is the defense that Paul lays at the feet of the Thessalonians. Those outside the church who claimed that he was nothing more than a fly-by-night charlatan would need to answer then why he had opened his heart and his life to the Thessalonian Christians. After he reminds them that he never used flattery, they were never out to get rich, they never sought the praise of people, he then presents the best defense that he can. He says, because we loved you so much, we were delighted to share our lives with you. The greatest and most precious of all gifts to give of yourself and expect nothing in return. This is the strongest defense of the gospel. Our love for one another in community, the familial nature of a church family. This is what testifies irrefutably to the presence of God among us. As Francis Schaeffer said, our relationship with each other is the criterion the world uses to judge whether our message is truthful. And so in the end, Christian community is the final apologetic. So the question would be put to Paul's critics, why? Why would Paul and Silas and Timothy open their hearts and, and, and open their lives and invest in this community so deeply without getting anything out of it in return? And for this, the critics would have no answer because the answer is hidden within the gospel itself. You see, it is only for the sake of Christian community, that peculiar self-sacrificing love of God, outworking itself among God's people. The new creation already underway, the culture of eternity breaking through into our current lives in the present day. This is the only reason that they would do such a thing. Love, real love, the love of Jesus. It knits our lives together in such a way that strangers become family. And it cannot be understood by an outside world. It must be experienced. May it be so for you at Pioneer Drive. Here's some questions for reflection and discussion this week. How is your example testifying to the goodness of Jesus? Where do you see the church functioning as a family? And why is Christian community important to you personally? Let's pray together. Father, we hear in this passage in 1 Thessalonians 2, the call to community. Although Paul does not make an explicit command or an exhortation, God, we, we still hear you whispering to us, the vitality of doing life together. God, we recognize and confess that our lives are the most precious thing we have. We're so grateful for the freedom to do with them whatever we choose. I pray, Lord, that you would give each one of us the wisdom and the courage and the faith to know the best thing we can do is share our lives with your people, with a local church and community. Lord, I pray that you would give each of us, those that maybe haven't found it, God, for the people that are maybe new here today or 
or maybe hanging out on the fringes, maybe haven't found that community yet, I pray, Lord, that you would make that path so easy and so clear that you would open those doors for them and that they would know and they would see and they would get their questions answered and they would find that family within the church family, that they would find that group of people that will love them and invest in them and share their lives with them. God, we thank you for the grace that is the local church. Help us as individuals, Lord, to be more like Jesus and help us, God, as a church to embody your kingdom values. Help us to take on more and more each day, each week, each month, each year, more of the culture of heaven. Help us to be a vessel for you to discover true family here. May we be an example to a watching world. For your glory, in Jesus' name we pray, amen.